Oh, hi. Hola. Como esta? Aloha. Asi, asi. If you, if you know how to say hello in a different language, feel free to, to add it to the list. Hi. Hi. But it's, it's real quick. Hi. Um, I, I think in Polish it would be Yakshamash, but I have no idea. I have no idea how to spell that. Uh, it, it, I'm sure there's no vowels in it. Uh, um, all right. Uh, let me point. Let me paint a picture of what the rest of the semester is, because this is week 12. All right. Week 12. We have week 12, 13, 14, and 15. So we have, in a nutshell, four more weeks. Well, 13, 14. Yeah, four more weeks. Um, we will uh, talk about interfaces more today. All right. We will talk about try catches. So it, it, we more or less have four more topics. I was I was just thinking of that. Interfaces. We're going to do some wrap up on that today. Try catches, which I hope you'd all be somewhat familiar uh, of from C sharp, but. Um, I have talked to students that have had this class before, and they say I go into more details than you do in C Sharp, but whatever. Then we'll talk about user interfaces, and then we'll talk about deploying applications. If we're pressed on time, um, deploying applications um, is, I hesitate to say less important, because that's actually what gets your application into the hands of the user. All right, which is probably pretty important. But if we're going to um, skimp on anything, that probably will be what I want to skimp on. Because it is important, as an educator, you're always torn. Because you have a certain amount of material that you want to cover. On the same token, you want to make sure you cover it in a way that people understand. All right, so it doesn't really do any good if, I, if we race through to get through if people don't understand it. So I'm always torn. Um, and uh, there, may be, there may be some days where we will have like as catch up days or work days on our labs like we had last Monday um, and uh, where there won't be a lecture. All right, I was thinking about this. So I have an advantage because I've been thinking about this in advance while you weren't necessarily doing so. Um, Someone define, someone give me a sentence or two definition of when you would use an interface. Because in my mind, that might be what's toughest. We can talk about the technical details, but for you to really understand like why we're even doing this, I, I think is important as well. So someone give me a sentence or two definition in your own words of why you would use an interface. Keep in mind, we're not talking about user interfaces here. We're talking about the, the, the thing that's kind of like an abstract class with all abstract methods that are interfaces. Why would we make an interface? Because it's on the assignment. OK, that would be a good answer, but I already used that one. So what would be another reason that would create the interface? OK, that's good. Um, by, by throwing in sort of, that, that, is, um, uh, th that helped it. Uh, the statement was to be able to sort of inherit from multiple things. And sort of is a good word here. We'll talk about what sort of means um, in a minute or so. Anyone else care to offer a definition of, or not a definition, why you would use an interface? I can understand if you're puzzled, because it's, it's a confusing concept. And, and until you've done some programming, and have worked on some problems, it might not necessarily be obvious. And it's even hard thinking of simple examples. That's why I kind of like the email example that we're doing in class. And I think the shape example is a good one. Um, 
in a nutshell, a interface allows you to define a common behavior across multiple classes where there's not a inheritance relationship between. Okay? So the key thing is common behavior. All right? Common behavior. That's what's important here. Now, common behavior in a way is similar to inheritance because when we talk about inheritance, we talk about, well, do they have attributes in common and do they have behaviors in common? You know, if we were going to define, you know, animals, mammals, what makes a mammal? Well, a mammal has certain behaviors in common with other mammals. You know, a dog. What makes a dog a dog as opposed to a cat? Well, a dog has certain behaviors in common with other dogs, certain characteristics and behaviors in common with other dogs. All right? But, remember, we can only inherit from one superclass. All right? A given class can only inherit from one superclass. And there are cases, and, and again, we perform the is a test. So a dog is a mammal. A mammal is an animal. So we perform the is a test. But remember, in some cases, there's these kind of like, well, yeah, I guess it is a, but it doesn't seem important enough to inherit from. The example we gave last time was email accounts or email recipients. You know, if you think about who gets emails from LC, when they send out a mass emailing or when they send out a mass mailing to your home or whatever, who gets those? A lot of different entities get those. People get those. People, members of the community get those. All right? Faculty gets those. Students get those. Businesses get those. All right? And so on. Now, that one little behavior or maybe even two or three little ba behaviors that you have is not enough to base an inheritance relationship on, right? It's not enough to base an inheritance relationship. However, it is important to somehow identify all these things have that behavior because we may want to treat those things the same with regards to this specific behavior. All right. So we're not treating them the same all the time, but with regards to this specific behavior, yeah, it's important that they have, it's important to identify that all these different classes have this certain behavior. I'll give you another example. Um, let's say, you know, let, let's, let's look at an electronic store, or let's even go beyond an electronic store. All right. Um, what are some things that are battery powered? Toys. All right. Mobile phones are battery powered. Um, laptops are battery powered. Um, Any example that's popping in my head is going to make me sound like I'm 100 years old. I was going to say a Walkman or battery powered. Yeah. <laughs> um, hand, handheld gaming devices that are not like a DS. And again, depending on our scope, automobiles have a battery. They're not battery powered necessarily, but automobiles have a battery. Watches have a battery. Um, tools have a battery. Now, you may be hard pressed to come up with an inheritance structure to fit all these in the same inheritance structure. So, for example, um, laptops is a computer, 
right? A laptop is a computer. So it would make more sense to have this guy inherit from computer. Automobiles are vehicles. And so on. So if we think about battery powered, yes, all of these are battery powered, but it's not necessarily the defining characteristic of these. Yet imagine this. Imagine we were a store that sold batteries. We open Batteries Are Us, all right, and we sell batteries, all right. Wouldn't it be nice to know for each of these battery powered items that there's a function that says, will this battery work, that will return a yes or a no, all right. So you have a battery object. And I don't know, the battery object has all the properties and methods that a battery object has, like how much voltage it pumps out, um, what type of battery it is, um, the physical size of the battery, um, all those sorts of things. All right? All those characteristics are in the battery object. Wouldn't it be nice? to have to know that there is a method on every one of these things that says will battery fit and it will take an argument of battery and it will return a true or false all right so if I had a battery in batteries are us and I ask the clerk will this battery work in my drill all right they would know that the drill is battery powered they would call the function on the drill will this battery work you'll pass it a battery object that has all the properties of the kind of battery that I'm holding in my hand and that class and that method would return a true or false saying yep that'll work in this drill no it won't work in that drill or yes it will work for your DS but no it will not work for your PlayStation Portable they still make those yes it will work in your um, Android um, Samsung phone as long as it doesn't catch on fire no it will not work in your iPhone alright or whatever alright it would be nice if you could guarantee that all these different things had that method. Because then, polymorphically, you could call that function, and as long as you call that function on something that was battery powered, you'd know that there was that method there. So you could you would be guaranteed that that method exists. That's what an interface is. An interface is a way for us to guarantee for these very different products that are all over the place as far as inherent structure goes. All right. It's a way of guaranteeing, yeah, but we can treat these polymorphically. We can ask every one of these the question, will this battery work? And give it a battery object and it will return a true or false. So I could make a battery powered interface and I could have all these things implement that interface. What does it mean to implement an interface? You're promising the compiler that you will have all the methods that are defined in the interface that you will define that method. So for example, how do I know if a particular mobile phone, if a battery will work in a particular mobile phone? Well, it depends on the type of mobile phone it is and the version and blah, 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 the manufacturer. If I knew all those things, I could, I could determine whether a particular battery would fit or not. How do I determine if a battery fits in a car? I don't know, but I'm sure there's rules for that, right? There's different rules for a battery for a car than there are for rules for if a battery will work on a phone. 
How do I know if a battery will work on your laptop? How do I know if a battery will work in your DS? How do I know any of these things? Well, every one of these things have their own rules for determining if the battery works or not. All right? And again, when you create an interface, you leave it up to every class to identify, gee, what is the rule for this class for determining if a battery works in it or not? And that class implements that rule. All you're doing when you create an interface and implement that interface is you are promising that any class that treats an interface, uh, that implements that interface, can be treated the same as far as this behavior goes. You can ask it certain questions, you can call certain methods on it, and get some output out. Like in this case, true or false. Now in our case, in the example that we were going over last week, we had a case of, we had, I think we said employees or faculty at a school, students, and vendors. And again, they're different. They're not necessarily going to fit in an inheritance structure. For one reason, if you think about it, simply put, students and faculty or students and employees are people, right? So they're going to have people attributes. Vendors are organizations, typically. So they're going to have company. So they're not the same thing. You can't have them as part of an inheritance structure. Probably not anyhow. But there may be some behavior that we want to have in common, that we want everything, all these three classes to have in common. And in the hypothetical example I came up with, the example was that we want to be able to send each of these an email. So we want to, we want to be able to do an, a mass emailing and get all of the employees, all of the students, all of the vendors. Well, a common behavior associated to that would be get the email address associated. Now in these examples, I'm only talking about one method living on each interface. You could actually have a bunch of methods. It's not just one method. But when you implement the interface, you're guaranteeing, you're promising the compiler that all of the methods defined in the interface will be defined in the class that's implementing the interface. And therefore, you get polymorphism. You can treat all of these the same with regards to they're all email recipients. So I can ask any of them what your email address is. And it will go through the proper logic or procedure or whatever to figure out the email address. Just like in this case, I could ask every one of these things, will this battery work if, I, if they all implement the battery-powered interface? And all of them will return either yet true or a false. So I know for sure that every one of these things will have that function if I implement the interface. So I can treat them polymorphically. Um, another example of, of, uh, of uh, where we could have used interfaces in previous examples, I guess I'm thinking of, to try to make this concept more clear. Think back to the pizza example where we had an order, right? And the order was comprised of a bunch of pizzas, right? Now, we define certain properties and methods of, as existing on pizzas. But a pizza shop typically is going to sell more than just pizzas, literally, right? They may sell a whole bunch of products. They might sell beer. They might sell pop. They might sell potato chips. They might sell, you know, who knows what, all right? All of these different products. Now, if I call in for an order, I might call for an order of, you know, I want um, a two liter of, of Pepsi, um, two large pizzas, some chicken wings, and, and maybe that's it, all right? Now, chicken wings are not pizza. Right? So we might not have chicken wings and pizza inheriting from the same thing. Maybe we have a food class. We could do that, have food and have pizza and, and, and chicken wings inherit from that. But Pepsi really isn't a food. I mean, maybe we have a beverage class and a food class. Right? Now, the thing is, though, is from the perspective of the order, we want to be able to treat all these items the same way. 
what would we want to be able to ask all the items on our order? One thing at least. How much do you cost? Right? So we could implement a item interface, a product interface, something along those lines, and we could define the methods that we wanted to have in common. All right? So we could then, we would not put pizzas on our order, we would put any item on our order. And by virtue of the fact that it was an item, it would have certain behaviors that we could count on there being there. So we could ask a beverage, how much do you cost? We could ask pizza, we could ask a sandwich, we could ask chicken wings. Maybe we sell newspapers too, what the heck, might as well get a little extra money there too. Something that isn't even food. But we could ask it how much you cost. If we made an interface for all the products that could be in our order, all right, we would then make our array list being of those, that interface, not of pizzas, all right, but of that interface. And we would know, the compiler would be assured that we can ask these things of every item that's on our order. I think the textbook calls it a contract. It's a pro or a promise. I, I don't know. Contract sounds so legally binding and like you might get sued if you do it wrong. Uh, a promise sounds better. All right? If you break your promise to a compiler, what's the compiler going to do? It's going to get mad at you and not compile your program. So it's not going to sue you. So I think promise is better than a contract. All right. So let's look at the example we had last time. We got so far in it, but we did not complete it. We did not complete it um, sufficiently to really show the advantages that you get from interfaces. So let's go and let's try to complete that today. So let's see what we've done so far. We've created an interface, and we've created a class that implements that interface. So our interface is this, email recipient. So public interface instead of public class. Public string, get an email address, and there's no arguments. So what does that mean? That means that our interface consists of one class. I'm sorry, one method. So every class that implements this interface has to have this method. Do we care what the contents of that method is? No. That email address could be constructed any number of different ways. We could have different rules for different entities within our problem. In fact, we even said that, that a uh, faculty member's e email address is one thing. A uh, student's email address is something else. A organization's email address is a third thing. All right? Now, we create this, we're promising that all the things that we define as email recipients, we want to treat the same way in the sense that we want to be able to ask those things, what is your email address? All right. How it comes up with that email address is up to that class. Just like how you know how, uh, whether a battery fits a certain product, you know, that's different for every product. Every product has its own set of rules about what batteries fit and what batteries don't fit. All right. We then implemented that interface in this class. 
where I said that the email address is the first name, last name, followed by at lorraineccc.edu. Now, of course, there could be a whole bunch of other functions in here related to being a faculty member. So all the gets and sets, all the calculations, all that kind of stuff. Calculation of what your load is, I mean, how many courses you're teaching this semester, and all the sorts of things that you would need to be able to ask a faculty class would be in this class as well. But we're not interested in those in the interest of time. We're only interested in the emailing this faculty person. All right? So we describe that they implement email recipient. That is a promise to the compiler that whatever else this faculty class has, it at least has to have that. At least has to have that method that we've defined in the email recipient class. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So in other words, I could say this extends blah, blah, and implements email recipient. Pardon me? I think the extends goes first. I've always seen the extends go first, but I honestly can't say if the order matters. Absolutely. Another great question. So, we could implement another class, or another interface. And what does that mean? Well, it means that this class, in addition to having all the things that are defined in the email recipient class, would have to have all the things that are in that other interface as well. All right? So, maybe um, faculty are email uh, and they're mailing recipients. Right? Because I always get the things mailed to my house, right? So maybe I'm an email recipient and I'm a mail recipient, snail mail recipient. Now there might be functions for that. What's your address? What's your city, state, and zip? So there might be address, city, state, and zip. There might be four methods on the snail mail recipient. And if I implemented that in the email recipient, I'd have to implement that function for the email one, and I'd have to implement the other methods that are defined on there. I do think the, co the compiler will complain if both interfaces would have the exact same function name, I think. Or maybe it would complain if there was a different signature. I don't know. That's kind of an advanced sort of issue. If you run into that, it's unlikely in this class anyhow. And uh, so I won't really talk about that. All right. Now, again, not to muddy the issue further, but if it did extend a class, the super class, you could implement the you could implement the method on the super class and that would take care of it. So it wouldn't, the method wouldn't have to actually be in this class. It could be up in a super class. And I'm like 99% sure that would be okay. All right. So let's go and compile this.
and it's okay, it will compile because I've kept my promise to the compiler. If I did not have this, or in fact if the signature was different, all right, like it returned something other than a string, the signature didn't match, then I've broken my promise to the compiler and the compiler gets angry at me. All right, so let's make a student and vendor class. And again, for the, and just in the interest of time, I'm not going to spend a long time defining methods. I'll just define a constructor for each of the student and vendor. I did not want to do that. So, let's make the student, and I think I said that a student's email address was their last name followed by their student number. So we have our constructor for that. And then getting an email address would be the last name plus student no plus lorraineccc.edu. And lastly for a vendor, Let's say we have a name and an email address. And the email address for a vendor is not calculated, it simply is whatever their email address property is. So we have that. Thank you. All right, so we save everything and let's try compiling. Ah. That should be vendor. Okay, so we have all these. All right, big deal, we can't do anything with it. So what are we going to do? We're going to create a mass email program to email everyone. All right, and so what I'm going to do is
I'm going to make a list of people to send my emails to. What type is that going to be? Our choices are, now in the case of when we had our orders, it was, our type was pizza. Because we wanted to, the only thing that were on orders were, were pizzas. All right. So in this case, are the only people we want to send our email to students? No. Faculty? No. Vendors? What are the one thing that they have in common? They're all email recipients. So I'm going to have my array list of email recipients. Go and copy some code here, real quick. Because I don't remember off the top of my head what I import and so on. So I'm going to download the latest pizza example. So for good measure, I'm just going to make one of each. All right. I'm just going to make Okay, so there's one of each of these. All right, now I can add each of those to my array list. So I can say recipients dot add s
f and v. And that's legal. And again, it's almost like the same thought process you do with pizzas and stuffed crust pizza. Can I add a stuffed crust pizza to an array list of pizzas? Well, yeah, because a stuffed crust pizza is a pizza. Well, it's sort of the same thing here. A faculty member is an email recipient. Now, it's not an inheritance relationship, but it is via the interface. Then I can have my loop here that says, I can just do recipient. And then I'm not going to send an actual email, but I could say I could print out the email address. And the compiler knows that that function is valid. How does it know that it's valid? Because I'm doing this to email recipients. Do I want pizza? No, we don't. Thanks. Unless we're emailing them to tell them they want a free pizza or something. All right. But we know that this is a legal statement because we know that anything we put on that array list is going to be an email recipient. And an email rep recipient, by definition, has all the functions that are in the email recipient interface, which is get email address, I think. Yes. OK, so let me save this. Oh. Oh, okay. And you're right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the compiler will tell me if I've made any other errors. That's what's nice about it. Let's save it as a Java file. with the name mass email. And let's try to compile it. OK, expecting. doesn't like me defining it there, so I'm going to define it here. Error cannot find symbol. The one thing that I, oh, pretty much all the errors have been typos except that one. The one error that wasn't a typo is I put this up here, which made it think it was an instance variable instead of a static variable. I didn't define it as static. 
And therefore, I just put it in here, and, and that took care of that. All right, so it compiles. And I run it, and I get the emails. All right. So the key thing of this is by defining an interface, I can guarantee that anything that implements that interface, I can treat the same with regards to the stuff of that interface. In a more strictly programming uh, perspective, I can guarantee it's going to have these functions. It can, I can guarantee it's going to have all the functions that are defined in the interface. If it doesn't, I'll get a compile error. Now, the, the details of that function could be wildly different. All right? I tried to make it a little bit different, but there's only so much you can do with an email address. Right? One where the email address is simply an attribute. One where it's calculated based on the first name and last name. One where it's the student number and last name. Again, think of the rules for determining if a battery fits. Or if you were having flying things, the rules to calculate how high something can fly or how fast it can fly. Well, that's going to be different from a bird to an airplane, how that calculation is done. But trust me, someone probably can calculate the maximum speed that an eagle can fly, you know, some eagle expert out there. All right? So as long, the, the, from an interface perspective, it doesn't care how that function the details of how that function is coded. We only care that somewhere in that class that function exists. Then we can treat it that way. Then we can treat all of those and it will work polymorphically where we get the right version of the function. All right, questions about this? All right, we'll see you up in lab. <laughs>